10 a.m. Welcome to week seven of this long short course. Um, we are now here back at Beacon Rock and we will stay at Beacon Rock for the remaining uh, four weeks. Um, the videos are up and running up through week six, although um, Steve Scott tells me that there might be some missing video from part two last time, and he and the, the tech people are working on trying to remedy that. Uh, there's some new stuff on the web page for you to know about. Um, I've moved things around a little bit. Um, also, uh, one of the suggestions that was made uh, for improvement in the mid-course survey, I keep forgetting to bring that to you and show you the results, but one of those suggestions was to, um, basically the person said, um, I'm busy uh, like everybody and you have given us a whole lot of handouts. <laughs> so um, how about uh, giving a grading of each handout from essential to helpful to optional? So, um, so I went ahead and did that. Um, so as you look back now, you'll see um, where things stand in that regard in the past from the handouts. And that was a nice suggestion. Um, and then uh, uh, I moved things around a little bit. Um, turns out that um, we spent... Um, part of week five and all of week six on hierarchical and mixture modeling. So I moved that back, and week seven now contains the model specification stuff that we're going to be working with um, today. Um, I posted also uh, the extra notes from uh, last week. They're here for you in their sideways form, since we're now using this new way to try to maximize the the content of the page without getting things cut off. I have a couple uh, more things I'd like to cover with you about hierarchical modeling before we start on the topic that will take us all day today and probably all day uh, next week as well, um, namely um, roughly 12 full hours of content on how to attempt to uh, specify Bayesian models in an optimal fashion and check them and when the current model isn't any good, try to find a better one and all of the things that we've been postponing. Up until now, um, we've been using the, uh, what I've been calling the cheating method to build our models. We look at the data, and the data suggests a particular structure for the model, and then we go ahead and pretend we knew that structure right from the beginning. And clearly that uses the data twice. So starting today uh, in the section on Bayesian model specification, we're going to do better. Um, and then in week nine, I'll be talking about um, approximate Bayesian computational methods with large data sets, and in week 10 I'll show you a variety of applications uh, that go into greater depth than the ones we've seen so far. Um, so to catch up with um, the, new, the things about hierarchical modeling that I wanted to cover with you, um, there are two new things here that you haven't seen before. Um, one of them is um, something that I wrote many years ago to straighten out my thinking and help other people straighten out their thinking on a variety of topics on hierarchical modeling, especially in applications in the social sciences. I'm not sure if there are many people in the room that have direct applications in that area on a routine basis, but um, there's a bunch of ideas in this paper that you might find um, relevant to the work you're doing even if you're not in the social sciences. And um, it was a discussion paper, so there's uh, my stuff and then at the end, there's discussion from a variety of uh, experts on hierarchical models and a rejoinder from me. And so uh, I've marked this as helpful. And if you have time to look through it, I think you'll, you'll, um, there's a good chance you'll, decrease, you'll increase your, the depth of your understanding uh, about, uh, about hierarchical modeling. Um, the other thing I posted under hierarchical modeling is a paper I wrote with a, a student a few years ago. Um, uh, Bill Brown was one of my PhD students when I was in England. Uh, and I do want to take you through this paper a little bit carefully because um, it shows some pitfalls of trying to fit hierarchical models um, using non-Bayesian methods. Another name in Britain for hierarchical models is multi-level models. They're talking about the fact that the data, um, data sets can often have a multi-level or hierarchical character. And we've seen examples of that before, for instance, um, in quality of care studies um, of the kind that I do with the, uh, my colleagues at Kaiser. Uh, we take a, 
random sample of hospitals, and then we take a random sample of patients nested inside the chosen hospitals. So that data set has a two-level character to it, and you might have of covariates, predictor variables, to help understand the outcome variable, both at the level of the hospital and at the level of the patient nested in the hospital. Um, this sort of thing comes up also in education, where you might have multiple layers of nesting. You might choose a school district in the state of California, and then uh, some, or some school districts at random in California, then some, some schools inside each, nested inside each school district and then some classrooms nested inside each school, and then some students nested inside each classroom, for example. So you can get um, uh, quite complicated data sets of that kind in which you might have covariates at all levels of the hierarchy. So um, we, Bill Brown and I, this was um, his, the bulk of his PhD work with me back when I was at the University of Bath in England, um, we built uh, some quite elaborate simulation studies to, that were set up to be realistic for the use of hierarchical modeling in education and medicine, uh, and in fact other fields of inquiry also, to examine the relative performance of Bayesian and non-Bayesian methods for fitting models of this kind. And so uh, one class of models we looked at was called variance components models, and our first example was an education um, example from uh, attempts by people in the London area to figure out um, what are the determinants of, of better and worse performance in mathematics for, for kids um, who were in what we would call um, third grade and fifth grade, basically. Um, math 3 and Math 5 are the, the uh, scores for um, these pupils at um, uh, year 3 in school and year 5 in school. And um, the data have a nested character. Um, uh, we're going to look at, in this little example I'll show you here, at. Um, uh, a random sample of 48 schools, I'll call that, that um, number of schools capital J, uh, and then a random sample of a total of 887 students nested inside those 48 schools. And they, ha they had all sorts of um, uh, background variables on everybody, male, female, how old were you at when the study started, um, what your ethnicity was, what your social class was, and then they had a whole bunch of outcome measures of educational attainment uh, in math and other aspects of what's going on. So you can imagine a a data set with, um, the, where the outcome variable, uh, let's say math at year five, um, has to be doubly indexed because we have to index the student and also the, the school that the student was nested in. And um, in a notation that um, is different from the one that I've been showing you so far for nested data, um, uh, because we use this notation because this is used very widely in, um, in uh, England for hierarchical models of this kind. Um, I have all my life been trained to write the data down in a hierarchical structure, so I'm looking at this yij right now in, uh, uh, in equation one uh, on page uh, whatever it was there, I guess page um, 475 of the, of the paper in the, in the journal. Um, I've always used the indexing that I stands for um, school and J stands for pupil nested in school, but all the people in Britain do it exactly backwards to that. <laughs> so um, for this uh, one paper, we're going to have to think of it the other way around. So J is the, uh, they, in other words, they regard the, the uh, cluster units as forming the bottom of the hierarchy rather than the top. So they think of the schools being at the bottom and the students being above them in the hierarchy. Um, and so little J runs from one to capital J how many schools we have. And then little i runs from 1 to n sub j because each school had a different number of pupils in it. Um, and uh, uh, a standard variance components model would be the first thing you might fit to the data before you start putting in any covariates at the uh, uh, pupil level or the uh, school level. And what people mean by a variance components model is um, the outcome variable yij is the math score for pupil i in school j. And then we have a grand mean beta zero, which represents the average performance of all the math students um, on, in year five in the population to which it's appropriate to generalize outward from this data. And then uh, there are so-called random effects at the, at the um, school level because we chose the schools at random. So the UIJs are thought of as like random draws from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared u. Um, and also the... Um, uh, there will also be random effects at the pupil level, which tend to be described in models like this as error 
terms, but they, what they really represent is random effects down at the level of the pupil, and those are assumed to be random draws from a different normal curve with a mean zero and a different variance, sigma squared E. And the n sub j's, the sample sizes in each school, let's say, add up to capital N as the total sample size. So capital N here is 887. Now, um, you can fit this model in a bunch of different ways. You can use maximum likelihood-based methods, or you could use Bayesian methods. And uh, ML, for short, maximum likelihood, in turn, may be based on a, a variety of different methods. There's a technique called iterative generalized least squares, uh, which um, uh, is um, somewhat um, sillily, if there's such a word pronounced, eagles. Um, <laughs> um, and then you could try uh, uh, the, the trouble for people who like to look at unbiased estimators, the trouble with um, the iterative generalized least squares estimates is that they tend to be biased. And so um, people like to use a version of estimation in the frequentist world called restricted maximum likelihood, or REML for short, uh, which has tried to remove the bias. Um, and um, there's a thing that goes along with Eagles called Riggles, <laughs> which is restricted iterative generalized least squares that tries to, to uh, um, remove the bias in your estimation process. Uh, and then on the Bayesian side, we have um, um, the basic choice we have, because there's no difference in fitting method. You always just fit the model and get out the posterior distribution and summarize it. But you have um, different ways to try to specify priors on the unknown parameters in the model. So, here, the parameters are beta 0 and sigma squared u and sigma squared e. Um, and um, I'll talk a bit more a little while from now about the sort of priors we used for, for those parameters. Um, and so here's an example. Um, on the full data set, um, the, if you compare the three different methods for estimating um, the uh, parameters of this model, as long, along with uh, two different methods for building uh, interval estimates. Um, the parameter beta 0 in this data set um, turns out to be about 31. The scale that they used for math scores uh, was a um, quantitative scale ranging from 0 up to 50, I believe. And so the students are averaging about 31 on that scale. And you see that ML gives 30.6, and REML gives 30.6, and Bayesian with diffuse priors also gives 30.6. So everybody, all the different estimation methods agree with each other perfectly for beta 0. Moreover, the standard error from maximum likelihood is about 0.40. And from REML, it's about 0.404. And from the Bayesian story, it's about 0.43, a little bit bigger. And that's actually rather characteristic, because it turns out that, as we're going to see, there's a, there's a routine pattern here of um, the point estimates from the maximum likelihood approaches perhaps being pretty OK. But the, uh, although they tend to sometimes be uh, biased on the low side for variance components, um, but the standard errors for these estimates tend to be smaller than they ought to be um, when you approach things from a calibration point of view. So um, everybody agrees on this, the value of beta 0 in this model, beta 0 hat um, in this model. Uh, but we differ a little bit on the standard error we would attach to it, or in this case, in the Bayesian approach, the posterior standard deviation. Um, and now when we start looking at the variance components, we see even sharper differences. Maximum likelihood gives an estimate of the between schools variance of about 5.2, 5.3 from the REML method, but a, a substantially larger estimate, um, 6.09 from, uh, from the Bayesian approach. And the uncertainty bands are quite a bit bigger as well. Um, so uh, from a point of view of pragmatism, um, you would probably, uh, you might say, well, I like the maximum likelihood approach because it produces narrow uncertainty bands. And we always love to have narrow uncertainty bands, don't we? But I'm about to show you that, in fact, uh, they're wrong. That's right. <laughs> uh, because they're, um, they're supposed to cover 95% of the time. And actually, they, they cover, in some cases, dramatically less than that. Um, and then the uh, variance at the pupil level, uh, there's hardly any disagreement at all. Uh, all three methods give precisely the same answer. The point estimate is practically the same, and the standard errors are practically the same. So um, on the full data set, there's um, actually a, a slightly disturbing amount of, of difference amongst these three fitting methods. And so now you, you basically want to ask the question, which of these methods is better, and also which of them is actually reproducing truth. So we want to create a simulation environment, as I've mentioned many times, in which we know what the right answer is, and we create many data sets that are like the, the, the junior schools project data, um, having parameter values that are similar to the ones we see in the world. Um, and then we look uh, and build intervals, for example, with the Bayesian approach, build intervals with the um, 
maximum likelihood approach and compare them on how well they actually include the truth. Uh, also, if you look down at the interval estimates in this table, um, there's not much difference between the Remmel approach um, uh, and a Bayesian approach for beta zero, and not that much for sigma squared E, but there's quite a big difference in the uncertainty band you would create of a confidence interval style nature or a posterior uh, interval from the Bayesian approach. So basically, it, it begs the question, um, these things are definitely different, so it begs the question, which, which one is better? The second example we looked at was from uh, medicine. Um, it was from a study that was conducted some years ago in Guatemala uh, that related aspects of mothers, uh, mothers-to-be, um, to aspects of their children uh, once the children were born. Um, so in Guatemala in those days, and I'm sure this is still true, um, you can get prenatal health care as a mother-to-be uh, either from uh, Western-style uh, physicians and nurses and so on, or you can get um, prenatal care from traditional um, uh, medicine people uh, from the indigenous communities. And so um, you have two choices. You've got Western versus traditional um, uh, prenatal care, and that means that the outcome variable of interest here is binary. So Y sub IJK here is a binary indicator of modern prenatal care or not, and I have to tell you what the I and the J and the K stand for. Um, this data set was gathered in the form of a multi-stage cluster sample. Um, first, they chose 240 communities at random. Then they chose 5,160 women at random in those communities. And then they followed those women over time and got information on them across multiple births. And so we have birth nested inside mother, nested inside community. So those are the three levels here. Um, the, um, the I indexes um, the so-called level one units, which stands for the births. The J indexes the level two units, which stands for the mothers. And three indexes the level three units, which stands for the communities. Um, and uh, the people who gathered this data were interested in predicting um, as a function of covariates that they had available at the community level and also the mother level and also the birth level. They were trying to predict um, what was the probability that any particular birth would be uh, undertaken under modern prenatal care or not. Um, and they collected all the covariates at the birth level into one composite scale called X1. They collected all the covariates at the mother level into one composite scale called X2. And they collected all the community level covariates into one composite scale called X3. So the model um, looks as it does there in equation two. It says, uh, everybody, every birth has its own probability of having arisen under modern prenatal care or not, um, PIJK. And if you knew what the PIJKs were, the YIJKs would be independently Bernoulli draws with probability PIJK. And now the standard story is to write down, um, as you recall, probably the logit of a probability is the logarithm of the odds ratio. So you work out the log of P over 1 minus P. Um, and we try to relate that linearly to these predictor variables at the three different levels we have the data at. And then we have random effects for the mother and random effects for the community. And the mother random effects are the UJKs, and they're thought of as IID uh, random normal draws from uh, random draws from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared U, which stands for mother, the between mother variability. And the VKs are also thought as random effects, thought of as random effects like random draws from a different normal distribution, also with mean zero, but with variance sigma squared V. The beta one and beta two and beta three parameters in this model are referred to as fixed effects because they represent um, regression slopes with respect to predictor variables that are regarded as fixed and known. Uh, and the, the um, sigma squared U and the sigma squared V are called variance components at the mother level and at the community level, respectively. And the UJKs and the VKs are called random effects, um, the UJKs being the random effects at the mother level because the mothers were chosen at random, and VK, the community level random effects because communities were also chosen at random. So this model has um, beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. That's four fixed effects parameters and two random effects parameters, the variance on the U's, the between mother variability, and the V's, the between uh, community variability. Um, and uh, the people who gathered the data 
uh, were not willing to make the data publicly available, but they did simulate 25 data sets with the same structure, but with known parameter values, and they made those simulated data sets available to Bill Brown and me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's right. Um, well, that was another one of the outcomes. So a different outcome was um, to look at the, the how well the child um, was able to thrive over the first six months after birth, for example. That would be an even more important outcome. But this would be regarded as a kind of process measure on the way toward that outcome. So did, the, did, the, um, uh, for, did that particular birth, on that per the occasion of that particular birth, did the mother use uh, Western-style prenatal care or not? And as you say, the, the real interest would have been on what the health outcomes were, but this is an intermediate analysis on the way to that, looking at the process variable of whether they got um, Western care or not. So here are some results for uh, one of the simulated data sets that, um, that uh, uh, we got from the authors of that Guatemalan maternal study. Um, we, now, we know what the right answers are for each of these parameters because the data were simulated from a, a world which things are known. And so beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 were all set to 1.0. In fact, all those variances were also set to 1.0. And beta 0 was set to 0.65 to correspond to the overall prevalence of, of uh, Western-style um, maternal care. And now we have three different ways to try to estimate the parameters of this model. Um, and uh, the actual estimation would occur in an environment like WinBugs or RJAGs with no trouble using the same exact syntax I've shown you so far for how to fit hierarchical models. So there wouldn't be anything new for us here in looking at this part about doing the Bayesian fitting. Uh, I haven't told you yet which are the good diffuse priors to use and which ones aren't so good, but um, if you spot me that for a moment. Now we have two different ways to, um, to do the, the likelihood-based methods. Um, the right way to fit this model from pure likelihood, based, uh, pure likelihood methods is complicated um, because uh, in order to get a likelihood function out of this thing, you would have to try to write the sampling distribution of the Ys directly in terms of those parameters, beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and the sigma squared u and sigma squared v. And the only way to do that is to actually integrate out the random effects, um, which stand at a kind of intermediate level in between the parameters that you want and the, the outcome variable that you, that you have. Uh, and that integration is um, uh, complicated and unpleasant from a frequentist point of view. And so most software doesn't try to do that. It tries to, to use um, what are called quasi-likelihood methods. If you are familiar with the package SAS, for example, um, as a statistical analysis environment, um, most of the SAS routines uh, that fit models like this are not using pure likelihood methods. Uh, instead, they're using uh, quasi-likelihood methods in which you try to um, create a linearized version of the model that allows you to integrate out the random effects and hope the linearized version is close to the actual version, essentially. They use Taylor series to try to linearize things. Um, and basically, uh, you then have a choice as a user of these MQL, marginal quasi-likelihood methods, and PQL, penalized uh, or predictive quasi-likelihood methods. You can decide between MQL and PQL, and you can decide how many terms you go out in the Taylor series. So MQL1 means you go out to the constant and the linear term and PQL2 means you went out to the constant and linear and quadratic terms. So you expect that a PQL2 will perform better than MQL1. And you don't know yet until, you, until we did our study how well either of them did with respect to the Bayesian story. So um, MQL is a disaster. Um, uh, check it out. The right answer is 0.65. MQL gets 0.5. The right answer here is 1. MQL gets 0.8. In fact, Everywhere you look, there's terrible bias from um, all these point estimates. And look, the, the um, um, variance component at the community level is estimated um, too low by a factor of about two. And the variance component at the mother level is estimated to be zero, when the right answer is a sigma squared for, for the between the mothers is, is one. And in fact, it comes out zero from MQL. PQL does better. If you look, uh, the point estimates are all quite a bit closer, or most of them anyway, quite a bit closer to the right answers. But the variance components are still being badly underestimated. Um, this is supposed to be 1 right here. Instead, it's 0.883. This is supposed to be 1. Instead, it's 0.486. And then the Bayesian approach with particular choices of diffuse priors, um, uh, everywhere you look, everything is pretty good, except we're not doing, on this one particular data set, we're not doing that well on the beta 2 parameter for some reason, although we're doing better than PQL did. Um, but 
in particular, notice that the Bayesian point estimate of the thing, the variance component that's supposed to be 1 is 1.04, and the other variance component that's also supposed to be 1 is 0.92. So much better anecdotally on the, this particular simulated data set. And the intervals, if you look at them, they t the Bayesian intervals are all substantially wider. Um, and uh, um, then the question becomes, um, this is the first evidence from a simulation that uh, the MQL and PQL methods don't work that well. But it's still anecdotal because it's based only on one simulated data set. So what you have to do to really understand what's going on is to simulate hundreds or thousands of such data sets and average the results across all those simulations. So that's what Bill and I did in his dissertation. While we were doing it, we also um, got together with people um, who had already previously created uh, a package for uh, fitting multi-level models, models to data called um, MLWIN. I think I mentioned it to you before. Um, and we, uh, which uh, the ML part was for maximum likelihood, and prior to our Bill, Bill and I um, appearing on the um, on the scene, it didn't have any Bayesian capability. So the other thing that Bill and I did with, as part of his dissertation was we fully enabled the the ML Win package with full Bayes um, solution capabilities. And so uh, now I will show you the results across the simulations. In fact, I'm going to focus on. There's a lot of details that you don't need to absorb about, um, about how to do the MQL and how to do the PQL and so on. Um, I do have to tell you about different possibilities for fitting diffuse priors on, on variance parameters. So let me go over here to the, the uh, document camera and let's talk about that for a moment. Let's take, first of all, that um, simple variance components model that was um, first looked at for the information about students' math scores. So we have beta 0 plus uj plus eij. And remember, j indexes school now, and i indexes pupil because the British do it um, backwards to us. It's sort of like driving on the other side of the road, right? Um, so school and pupil. Um, so these things here are supposed to be iid normal with mean 0 and variance sigma squared u. And these things here are supposed to be IID normal with mean 0 and variance sigma squared E. So you have your three parameters here. There's beta 0, and there's sigma squared U, and there's sigma squared E. And from a Bayesian point of view, you have to augment the likelihood part of the model by, by putting down priors on these things. Um, and what we focused on in this paper was diffuse priors, because we are trying to create software where the general case is that people don't know that much about these parameters before they start um, investigating um, based upon the data. But we also allow for the possibility in, in MLWIN that people have informative priors, and we structure how to bring that information in as well. Um, so I'm going to tell you about how to uh, good, good diffuse priors for models like this. So for beta 0, it turns out you know, beta 0 lives because it's an it's a, it's a intercept term in this, in this analysis of variance sort of model. It lives anywhere it wants on the whole real line. And so you can just use a normal prior with a mean 0 and um, huge variance, which corresponds, of course, to tiny precision, if you're thinking about things in the Winbugs and RJAGS world, tiny precision, e.g., you've seen me use before 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6. And that turns out to produce nicely calibrated um, answers. And so we're good. What I mean by good is, in parentheses, well calibrated priors to give the answer, the right answer about the right amount of the right amount of the time, well calibrated. Now, for sigma squared u, also for sigma squared e, it turns out not to matter very much, because you're going to have a lot of data um, for sigma squared e. Um, the total sample size in this experiment was something like 887. And all 887 of those values are relevant to estimating the between pupil variability, because you've got 887 pupils. So you have a huge amount of information there. Um, the number of schools, if I remember correctly, in this study was 48. And I think I've told you before that a strange thing about uh, multi-level or hierarchical data is that the concept of how much data you have is a bit more ambiguous with data sets like this. We saw this when we were talking about the uh, meta-analysis for aspirin. Uh, at the level of the patients in those six studies that we combined information across, we had, uh, I think, on the order of 10,000 observations. We had 5,000 patients in treatment and 5,000 in control, roughly, maybe even 11,000. 
But at the level of studies, we only had six studies. And I mentioned to you that for some purposes, the effective sample size of that um, sort of meta-analysis is quite close to 11,000. But for other purposes, it's much closer to six. And so you would agree with me, those two numbers are quite different. Same thing is happening here. For learning about the between pupil variability, every pupil contributes information to learning about the between pupil variability. So the effective sample size for sigma squared E is on the order of 887 in this, in this particular data set. Whereas for learning about between school variability, um, the effective sample size for learning about sigma squared u is much closer to 48 than it is to 887. And so that means that, um, and by the way, for learning about beta 0, um, every single pupil has the beta 0 inside his or her prediction equation. And so that number there, 887, is essentially the effective sample size. I'll call ESS for effective sample size. The effective sample size for beta 0 is around 887. The effective sample size for this thing here is around 87, uh, 887. And the effective sample size for this thing here is much smaller. It's on the order of 48. And in fact, in our uh, previous ex um, meta-analysis experiment, it would have been much smaller than that on the order of 6. So ESS stands for effective sample size. Basically, in other words, how much information do you really have about these things uh, hidden inside the hierarchical data set? So beta 0 and sigma squared e um, uh, are not difficult to put diffuse priors on and get well calibrated results because you've got a lot of data for them. Uh, and so once again, we can use something like a, uh, a gamma epsilon epsilon prior on um, 1 over sigma squared e. You remember that's the precision, um, the precision. And you can use a value like 0.001 for gamma, and everything's going to be fine. Um, but for sigma squared u, much more care is required. And I'm going to mention three possibilities. And Bill and I explored two of them in this simulation study because we were trying to um, document what people were typically doing in those days in the early 2000s. Uh, and then uh, um, Andrew Gelman, who is someone who works vigorously in the um, hierarchical modeling uh, arena, published a, a discussion comment on our paper along with our paper in which he suggested that a third prior that we did not look at was actually better than either of the two we used. And we have since done our work over again and uh, confirmed that he was right about that. So the priors we used in the paper were, uh, one, we tried the same gamma epsilon epsilon on 1 over sigma squared u. Uh, that was one of the paper priors in the paper. Another one was to use a uniform prior um, with uh, running from 0 to 1 over epsilon, so uh, a very wide uniform prior on uh, the variance sigma squared u. And these were the ones that we used in our paper. But what Gelman showed is that you get better calibrated results, as I think I mentioned to you before, by using uniform C prior on, on the standard deviation scale, not on the variance scale. So you don't try to fit a diffuse prior on the precision scale, and you don't try to fit it on the variance scale. Instead, you try to fit it on the standard deviation scale, where once again, C is a number that's chosen to be just big enough to not truncate the likelihood function. Just big enough to, uh, yes? Well, um, we are still, we're starting with the data, the YIJs, on the scale on which they come to us. So well, the data is just on whatever scale it is. And so beta 0, if this was money, YIJ would be in, um, in dollars, and beta 0 would be in dollars. And sigma squared u would be in dollars squared, and sigma squared e would be in dollars squared. Uh, but that's just the usual thing of us thinking about normal distributions as being parameterized by their variances, rather than, let's say, their standard deviations or their precisions. That's right. So Gelman is saying it just turns out as a technical matter that for the purpose of coming up with well-calibrated priors on the variance component that is the, is the part of the hierarchy that does not have much data in it, he just discovered as a technical matter it turns out to be better to put a uniform prior on the standard deviation scale rather than either of those other scales. We don't really have to go back and reparameterize our model. All we have to do is be careful about the scale on which we put our uniform prior. 
Um, uh, no, it's not. Um, it's a general pattern with regard to um, all hierarchical data sets like this in which um, one of the variances you're interested in will typically be informed by not very many units in the data. For example, not very many studies in the meta-analysis or not many schools or not many hospitals or whatever it is. The, the variance component that connects with the between unit variability where the unit is the cluster unit, might, it might be school or, or study or, um, or hospital, for example, that variance component is delicate and needs to, the prior end it needs to be chosen carefully and I now adopt Gelman's advice despite what we did in this paper here uh, I adopt Gelman's advice now. Uh -huh. You're not truncating the likelihood anymore. That's right. Um, no, because a uniform prior on one scale does not transform to uniform on the scale of the variable that's squared from it, right? So you have to pick your scale. Uh, you, did, you would have to do the change of variables um, to see what, what the uniform on the variance scale transformed to on the SD scale. So just big enough to avoid truncation of likelihood. So I didn't, this is another plan ahead. I didn't do a very good job of uh, uh, planning ahead as far as the um, writing on this page is concerned. But um, so this is Gelman, and he gave all of us a valuable contribution by pointing that out. And this one we tried in Brown and Draper, and this one we tried in Brown and Draper. And we got pretty good results with, um, with uh, particularly the uniform prior on the variance scale, but Gelman showed you get even better results with the uniform prior on the, on the standard deviation scale. So again, technical details about how we set up the, um, uh, how we did the Gibbs sampling, uh, and how we um, did um, adaptive um, hybrid metropolis Gibbs sampling in the, the uh, random effects. This thing back here, the one for the Guatemalan data. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I always forget to do that. Um, this um, thing back here, uh, the model that, that um, we fit to the Guatemalan data, is called a random effects logistic regression model because it's it's a log it's clearly a logistic regression because of that logit expression for the uh, the probabilities, and it's a random effects logistic regression because it has these random effects floating around in it. So, R E L R random effects logistic regression model, and um, we um, had to come up with a, um, a somewhat um, sophisticated way to create a general algorithm, a Metropolis Hastings algorithm for doing the AMCMC in there, but we uh, were able to do that without much trouble and programmed it into MLWIN. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff about how we designed the simulation study. And we looked at um, et the bias of estimators and um, the um, length of the intervals that arise uh, and uh, the coverage of the intervals. And I'm going to focus just to wrap this part of things up. I'm going to show you the results for the random effects logistic regression models and I'm going to focus on the calibration issues. So you're building intervals, and you claim they cover the truth 95% of the time. How often do they really cover the truth? Well, eventually toward the bottom of the paper, we get to a pretty shocking result. This table, I think, is already pretty shocking. Um, averaging over all of our simulation replications, for that variance component between the mothers in the Guatemalan study, the right answer is 1, and MQL is getting uh, 0.03 for that variance component. It's just desperately, badly underestimating what the right variability is there. PQL doesn't do much better. Bayes is almost getting things perfectly correct. In fact, here's Bayes with two different priors. We used uh, inverse gamma, epsilon, epsilon on, the, um, on the, the variance, so like gamma, epsilon, epsilon on the precision, and then we used a uniform zero infinity prior on the, on the variance scale. Um, and um, they, the right answer sort of splits the difference between the two, but you were right, very much right in the ballpark. Um, so PQL and MQL not behaving very well, and this picture, which I will now show you, um, nails it down pretty shockingly, actually. Um, what we did was, uh, when you get your information out for about these posterior distributions, 
you don't have to build just a 95% interval. You could build a 98% interval, or you could build a 37% interval. You could pick all the percentage points. Let's go uh, in units of 0.01, from 0.01 all the way to 0.99. And if you're well calibrated, your 1% interval should cover about 1% of the time, and your your blah blah percent interval should cover blah blah percent of the time, right? And so you can plot the actual coverage against the the nominal coverage, and it should look a lot like the straight line, the, the line y equals x. And so the Bayesian story um, is the um, crosses the uh, the x's here, and as far as beta zero is concerned, you can see that the crosses are practically uh, coincident with the with the the line that shows perfect calibration. Um, the MCMC with the inverse gamma does just about equally well. The PQL method um, is doing almost as well as the Bayesian methods for the parameter beta zero, and MQL is just hideous. If you look at this curve here, you are claiming, let's say, 60% coverage of your interval, and it's actually only covering 40% of the time. You're claiming 90% coverage, and it's actually only covering 65% of the time. So um, really, really bad. Then for beta one, even a little worse for, P for MQL. Um, still doing okay for PQL, then for beta 2, worse again for, for MQL, and now PQL starting to not show very well um, as well. Up on um, beta 3, uh, similar, but now let's look at the variance components. For sigma squared U, um, we tried two different ways to sort of rescue PQL. They're both rubbish. Um, we, tried, we, we tried everything we could think of to rescue um, uh, MQL, and it's complete rubbish. Um, and the two different methods for, for using different priors from the MCMC approach are, again, almost perfectly calibrated. And then for sigma squared u, the hardest parameter of all to estimate, you can see um, uh, MQL is complete rubbish, and PQL is not, is not far from rubbish, and the Bayesian methods are undercover a little bit, but not, not too badly. And this was a big shock to people when we published this paper because um, people are using these, uh, th this MQL and PQL, it's a button in SAS, and you can go to SAS today, even now, and press that button, and it'll give you intervals out, um, and um, it doesn't give you any warning that they're bad intervals. It just tells you that these are the intervals. Um, so, uh, and uh, the SAS people, uh, we sent them a copy of our paper, and they have chosen not to respond. They just, I mean, their software is the same as it was before, so, so there you go. Um, so that's a paper that you might find, um, if you have extra time and interest, you might want to delve into it a little bit farther. Uh, in particular, Gelman's discussion is particularly um, revealing. So I think that, um, maybe I'll look down in the data part and see if I had anything else I want to show you about um, things to do with, with um, hierarchical models. Um, I am going to show you another hierarchical model um, in which Frequentist unbiased estimation produces ridiculous results, but I think I'll wait on that until we get partway into the model specification notes, and I think the other things I'm going to show you later on. So let's jump in now for the rest of our first hour today. Let's jump into um, section one of the Bayesian model specification story. And I'm going to go ahead and download that to my desktop. During the next 15-minute break, I seem to recall uh, while driving over here that the very most recent version of this I forgot to um, load onto the, the web page. So during the first break, I'm going to take a few minutes to um, load the very best, uh, most recent version of it. But we'll be able to get into part of it now without um, computer. Oh, I just want to put it on the desktop. Why can't I put it on the desktop? Are you okay with that? All right, good. Um, so, let's see, can I go full screen? Yes, I can. Um, we are now at a kind of watershed for this course. Um, we understand how to do inference and prediction in the basic Bayesian paradigm for simple examples, um, all the way up to examples including some complexity. For instance, that random effects Poisson regression model that we fit last time. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a relatively sophisticated model, and by using um, various MCMC engines such as WinBugs and RJAGs, we were able to overcome the computing difficulties that arise in the Bayesian approach from having to approximate high dimensional integrals. We basically solve all those problems by sampling from the posterior distributions instead of trying to do the integrations in some other numerical form. But everything we've done up until now 
has involved this kind of make-believe um, thing I've been calling cheating, where um, we pretended we knew what the right structure of the model was by looking at the data and seeing what looked like a good structure. And that has to be circular reasoning, because you use the data once to, in effect, establish your prior on model space, and then you use the same data set to update that prior based upon what you decided in, in part one. Um, and uh, imagine what would happen in an ordinary Bayesian analysis um, of, let's say, a one sample problem where you use the data to specify the prior and use the same data set to specify the likelihood function. When you're done, you'll have a very narrow posterior because, in effect, you pret are pretending that your sample size is not n but 2n. Um, and it will produce lovely narrow intervals. And if your boss really likes narrow intervals, that's a great way to make narrow intervals. Uh, but it's well, not. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Why not? Why not load seven more copies of the data into the into the prior? That's right. Um, uh, but of course, your boss also wants you to give um, give him or her valid intervals, and you're not going to get validity out of that um, uh, because you've used the data in both the prior stage and also the the uh, likelihood stage. So. Um, we're now embarking on today and next week on an attempt to, to approach the issue of how to specify Bayesian models in what you might call a more grown-up fashion. We're going to try to do this right from now on. And it's going to be harder than what we've done before because it's actually hard work to do this correctly. People out there in both the frequentist and the Bayesian paradigms today are still doing this thing that I'm calling cheating on a regular basis. You look at the data and, and specify the model with it and then go ahead and pretend you knew that was the right model all along. People are doing it all the time. Um, that is an especially injurious thing to do when you have relatively small data sets. Um, but it can, even, it can even bite you in the butt with rather big data sets, believe it or not. And so uh, let's try to figure out how to do better. So for that purpose, I'm going to step back um, and um, present. Uh, this is another chance to um, come out of the trees and look at the forest again. So I'm going to present an, uh, my attempt at an axiomatization of nearly all of the discipline of statistics. Um, and then I'm going to show you throughout, through that axiomatization that um, the foundations of probability um, seem quite secure um, because of work done by this man, Richard Cox, whom I've mentioned to you before. Um, he was able to come up with a, a logical progression from principles to axioms to a theorem that basically says if you want to achieve logical consistency in your uncertainty quantification, then the Bayesian approach is one way to do that. His theorem doesn't say it's the only way to do it, but his theorem says it's one way to do it, to achieve lo logical internal consistency. However, um, I believe that the foundations of inference and prediction and decision making are not yet secure because we still have basic foundational problems with the issue of how to specify our models in a way that, that we are retrospectively proud of. Um, fixing this would yield um, something with the, you might call a grandiose title of a, a theory of applied statistics. Because applied statistics is the part of statistics that's involved with the process of starting with the, mo the real world that you're, the problem that you're working on and trying to make a mapping from that real, real world problem to the model specification. And that particular mapping is something that um, um, is sufficiently ill-defined um, that we are still in the Bayesian world at the level of um, trying to appeal to vague ad hocries to help people do it in a good way. And I think that what we need is the same sort of progression from principles to axioms to theorems that we found in Richard Cox's work to actually um, uh, rigorize the, the process of Bayesian model specification. So uh, in addition to sharing with you some old ideas in this part of the course, I'm going to be sharing with you some quite new ideas in my own research, some of them not even yet published, uh, about how we can try to do better than, than simple ad hocery in, in specifying models. I'm going to offer you a series of four basic principles that seem to me to be quite relevant to the issue of how to avoid um, ending up with bad Bayesian models. Also, Cox's theorem has something else wrong with it. His theorem, well, it, it's a theorem, and so you could say it doesn't, it can't have anything wrong with it. It's just Correct. It's something of the form if A, then B. But to try to use Cox's theorem and actually solve problems in the world, there are two deficiencies. One is that Cox's theorem tells us that if you want to be logically internally consistent with the Bayesian approach, then you have to specify certain ingredients. And you as a scientist don't know how to specify those ingredients uniquely. The mapping from the problem you're working on to those four ingredients, it's going to turn out, is not unique. Um, the other problem with the theorem, 
is that um, it doesn't say anything about something that I believe personally is even more fundamental to science than, than just the distinction between Bayesian and non-Bayesian probability. Namely, his theorem does not require anybody to pay attention to the basic scientific question, how often do your methods for separating signal from noise get the right answer? There's nothing in his, his theorem that says you have to pay attention to that. Um, and I regard that, that's, that's this thing I've been referring to as calibration questions. I just showed you an example of it with those curves a minute ago. I think that questions like that are even more fundamental than Bayes versus non-Bayes. And that uh, it's as though that issue of trying to get the right answer, as often as you say, sits over top of all the Bayes versus non-Bayes stuff and, and, and dwarfs them in importance. And so it's our job to try to come up with a way forward that brings together ideas of calibration on the one hand with the ideas of logical internal consistency from, from Cox's theorem on the other hand. And this is still an active area of, of, of uh, fundamental Bayesian research. You will see when I start showing you that there's still too much ad hocery in model specification from a Bayesian point of view. That's way true from a Frequentist point of view, but it's also true from a Bayesian point of view. Um, we lack the logical progression from principles to axioms to theorems that would help make this less ad hoc. And I will offer you a calibration principle that will fix the problem with uh, 3A right there, the Cox's theorem doesn't pay attention to how often we get the right answer. And I can use Bayesian decision theory as a way to show even Bayesians that they should care about calibration. Frequentists are already in the, in the vigorous habit of thinking about calibration, because that's the whole point of Mr. Naiman saying, this is a valid 95% confidence interval machine I'm showing you here. And that means if the assumptions of the machine are true, then in the long run across repeated data sets, you'll get the right answer about 95% of the time. That's a fantastic notion of calibration. Um, so the frequentists are already on board about calibration, but some Bayesians today still aren't, and I think they should be. And I, I know how to use Bayesian decision theory to show them that they should be. And then I'll offer you three other principles, the modeling as decision principle, the prediction principle, and the decision versus inference principle. And they help um, reduce the, the ad hocery that, that I'm about to show you as well. So I'll return to this example that we just finished with um, uh, the in-home geriatric assessment case study that led us to that random effects Poisson regression model from a parametric point of view. And so remember the deal is that we, the, these people led by this guy, Dr. Hendrickson in Denmark, um, rounded up 572 elderly people who were representative of the population of all elderly people in Denmark in the early 1980s who were living in a non-institutionalized fashion, by which I mean they're not in nursing homes and they're not in hospitals. They're, they're living in their own homes or apartments. And they agreed to take part, and they were randomized about half to a control group that got standard health care, and the other half got standard health care plus that, that preventive medicine that was called in-home geriatric assessment. And we looked at data on the number of hospitalizations as one important outcome during the two-year life of the study. And as I mentioned to you, um, before, uh, it's always good form when you're designing a study to think ahead to what the, the, table, the tables that summarize the data are going to look like at the end. And so this thing here on page three, uh, that, which I've shown you before, is a kind of template at design time for what we're going to get to see in this, in this uh, study. And last time I showed you the actual numbers, and we fit a variety of models, some of which were bad and some of which were better. Um, and we were able, by that means, to end up with a model, a parametric model that seemed pretty good. Um, so you aren't going to know ahead of time that number K, which is the maximum number of hospitalizations in that two-year period that anyone experienced at all, either in the control group or the treatment group. But once that number K has been specified, you're going to get a vector of counts, N sub C0 up to N sub CK, for how many people in the control group had no hospitalizations at all, how many had one, dot, 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 up to how many had K. And you're similarly going to get a vector of length, oh, it's actually length K plus one, isn't it, uh, in the treatment group. Uh, for how many people in the treatment group had no hospitalizations, how many had one, dot, 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 up to how many had K. Those numbers are all known, unknown to us at, at design time. And uh, what we decided to do about the fact that we didn't know them um, uh, in our uh, slightly cheating method last time was to just go ahead and, and look at them. We actually looked at the counts, and we started making plots of the data, and we noticed, oh, it sort of looks Poisson. So let's maybe fit a Poisson model where we have independent Poisson um, uh, lambda sub control in the control group and lambda sub treatment in the treatment group. And we found that was a, a certainly a better model than a Gaussian model for the data, but it was not good enough because it turned out that the variance to mean ratio in both groups was substantially bigger than one. And so that led us to that mixture model where everybody has their own lambda, but then we think of the lambdas as like um, draws from a gamma distribution. 
Um, okay, we do know the N sub C and the N sub T at design time, 287 and 285. We don't know the, the control um, mean and standard deviation. We don't know the treatment mean and standard deviation. But once the data arrives, we're going to know all those things. And the, the quantity of principal interest here, if we now generalize outward from these 572 people to everybody in Denmark who's non-institutionalized at that time in the early 80s, Let's let mu sub c be the mean hospitalization rates for those people in that population if everyone in the country had no IHGA at all. And let's mu sub t be the same mean hospitalization rate if the whole country, all the people in that population, had IHGA. Those are the two numbers we're most interested in. And the quantity of principal interest to us is um, their relative difference. We could compute mu t minus mu c divided by mu c, and that would tell us the relative change in that hospitalization rate. And so I think already on the very first day of the class, I showed you this next slide, which pointed out that there are four basic activities that we do in statistics. We describe data without attempting to generalize outward from it. We draw inferences outward from the data set to the population that we're thinking of the data as like a random sample from. We make predictions of future data values, and we uh, help people make decisions in the presence of uncertainty. And um, these questions basically together encompass all of the discipline of statistics. Um, describing a data set D, generalizing outward inferentially from that data set D, predicting new data D star, and helping people make decisions even though they have more uncertainty than they would like. That, that really does wrap its arms around almost everything that, that people in statistics do. I know I'm deliberately omitting um, several things. I am including uh, one important thing is to design the sampling experiment, design the controlled experiment if you're going to do a controlled trial. I'm including design issues under decision making because you can actually think about um, Bayesian, you can think about design of experiments from a Bayesian point of view by using Bayesian decision theory. You can do that quite, quite um, profitably. Uh, and also design of, of sampling experiments can be done in a decision theoretic way. So I'm okay with that because it comes in under decision. One important thing that we do all the time that, in fact, is, is vital to having the results be useful is we spend a lot of our time um, making sure the data values themselves are of sufficiently high quality that it's worth doing all the modeling that we're going to do later on. And I'll call that process data quality assurance, or QA for short. I have not included that as part of my um, list of things statisticians do. And there's probably, if you thought about it for a while, there's probably a couple other things that I haven't included in here also. But I'm going to try to, to provide a, an axiomatization of all of statistics that covers description. Not, I'm not going to talk about description because it's, it's a non-probabilistic activity. But I'm going to try to axiomatize all of inference, all of prediction, and all of decision making. Looking at what? At the error? Uh-huh. Um, so uh, we. We fit a model to data, and the model makes predictions. And then we end up with equations that look like observed equals predicted plus error. Is that the kind of error you're thinking about, where we contrast what the data really said with what we thought it was going to say if the model were right? Is that the kind of error you have in mind? OK, so. Um, it's it's going to turn out that. Um, it's an important part of inference because you want your inferences to be good. Um, and um, that involves checking to see whether the model's any good or not by looking at those errors that you're talking about. Um, and it can be approached from a decision theory point of view. So it's basically it come, comes in under that, under that rubric. Um, so most of our models have the form, when we apply them to data, they have the form y equals y hat plus e hat. right? So this is the observed data. And this is the predicted data. And this is the so-called residuals, which represents the, the amount by which the predictions did not quite match reality. And uh, um, they are essentially, they act like estimated errors in a, in a model. And looking at the residuals is an important part of the process of seeing whether the model's any good or not. And we'll see some examples of that later today and also on a week from now. Um, so I regard those things as part of my story um, in order to aim, end up with good inferences and good predictions and good decisions. You have to be prepared to criticize the model, and that will come out as well. 
I see that it's time for our first break, so let's go ahead and break now. It's 10.01. We'll start again at 10.15. The level of detail I want to start with here uh, is not trees, and it's not even forest. It's more like um, uh, satellite <laughs> over, hovering over top of the Earth looking down. In other words, um, let's start with the big, big picture, and we'll use that to hone in on the uh, medium-sized picture that will occupy us for the rest of today and next week in trying to specify models well. Um, I may have mentioned this in the first week. I bet I probably did. But um, if you got uh, 5,000 statisticians together in the same conference, which they do every year at these things called the Joint Statistical Meetings, and that is actually every bit as frightening as it sounds, um, uh, and ask every single person to write down on a piece of paper what he or she thought was the definition of the discipline of statistics, you would get a lot of different answers. Um, so here in my very first item is my definition anyways. For me, statistics is the study of uncertainty, how to measure it well, and how to make good choices in the face of it. Now that definition contains an undefined term, namely uncertainty. So item two is another definition. Uncertainty is a state of incomplete information about something of interest to you. And I'm going to use you with a capital Y, as I have done sometimes previously, as a generic person wishing to reason sensibly in the presence of uncertainty. This was a device invented by uh, a guy called Jack Good a long time ago. So right from definitions one and two, statistics is about information. Because statistics is about uncertainty, and uncertainty is not having as much information as you need. Now, I make an axiom in item three that your uncertainty about whatever that something of interest to you is can always be expressed in terms of true-false statements, which we're going to agree to call propositions. For example, um, everyone in the room, I would predict, is uncertain about the truth status of the proposition that a Democrat will be elected US president in 2016. If there's anyone in the room who knows definitively whether that's true or false, I would like to um, go into business with you because we can make a lot of money together <laughs> with that information. Um, uh, here's another one. Um, proposition B, the in-hospital mortality rate for patients at hospital H admitted in calendar 2010 with a principal diagnosis of heart attack was between 5% and 25%. That's a true-false statement. I'm thinking about a particular hospital H, and we can definitively answer, based on the data we have, whether that um, mortality rate was between those two extremes. Now, an implication of those first three items, the two definitions in the axiom, is that statistics concerned your information about true-false propositions. Some people say that, that um, statistics concerns your beliefs about true-false propositions. In fact, that's a, a, a pretty standard narrative among some Bayesians. But I think, actually, because statistics is the study of uncertainty, and because uncertainty is about information, that statistics is about your information, about tr the truth status of true-false propositions whose truth status is unknown to you, not your beliefs. Axiom item five, however, it turns out that your information cannot be assessed in a vacuum. You always have to make assessments of that kind relative to, and, and that always means in the Bayesian world conditional on, your background assumptions and judgments about how the world works vis-a-vis -vis the things you're thinking about. I make another axiom, item six. These assumptions and judgments, which are themselves a form of information, can always be expressed in a set script B of propositions. And I'll give some examples in a minute. In fact, maybe I'll skip right to those examples now. Top of page seven. In the in-home geriatric assessment study, um, you would have in your set of background propositions, all believed by you, all, all known by you to be true, um, the following um, things. Um, you would have the true-false proposition that subjects were representative of, by which you mean like a random sample from script P, because the guy who ran the study went to a lot of, of trouble to make that to be true. Also, 
The subjects were randomized into one of two groups, the treatment, care, the treatment group that got standard care plus the IHGA or the control group that got standard care. In other words, one of the main things that script B does is it, it encapsulates in a series of true-false statements background information having to do with the design of the data gathering activity. Back on page six, item seven is another definition. We've been talking informally so far about the, something of interest to you. I'm going to call that thing theta. In applications, theta is often a vector or a matrix or an array of real numbers. But in principle, it could be almost anything. The thing unknown to you could be an, a complete function, a whole smooth continuous curve on the whole number line. Um, it could be uh, an image of the surface of Mars at a particular point in space-time. It could be a phylogenetic tree that um, shows the point at which two species diverged in the past. Um, theta, your unknown thing, could really be almost anything. And in the in-home geriatric assessment example, theta is the mean relative decrease in hospitalization rate in the population of the form mu t minus mu c over mu c, which is something that we looked at parametrically in our hierarchical modeling last week. Yes, please. That, that's part of my story here as well, implicitly. Um, in fact, uh, as long as theta is finite dimensional, um, and a function, strictly speaking, is not finite dimensional because you have to specify its values at, in fact, if it's a function that starts with a real number and gives back a real number, you have to specify its values at, a, at an uncountably infinite number of places. Um, that's actually just an idealization of way, the way things would really work in the world because you can never observe an uncountable continuum in your actual life. The process of observing things always discretizes it. So, so even a function could be thought of as a, as a finite um, thing, although you might have to sample it at many, many, many points to fully flesh it out. But I'll, I'll leave that aside because sometimes later today and, and certainly next week, some of the things that are unknown to us will in fact be functions. For example, um, you could talk about all of the numbers in some outcome variable of interest to you, all the values across everybody in the population, and you could collect those numbers together and make a cumulative distribution function of those numbers. That would be what we would call the, the population cumulative distribution function, and it's going to be a function that starts with a real number and gives you back a real number. So we may find it convenient to think of that as uh, an object that is uncountably infinitely complicated. Um, but for right now, I'm going to think only about uh, quantities theta that are finite dimensional. And that being the case, um, without loss of generality here, whenever I talk about theta, you can always just think of a vector of real numbers of length k, where k is some integer that's finite. Um, because even a phylogenetic tree can be written as a vector of real numbers. Even an image of the surface of Mars can be written as a vector of length k. k might be really big, but you could do it. So um, k represents the dimensionality of the unknown. In our simplest problems, for example, in that IHGA example, k is 1 because we only have that one quantity theta, that mean relative decrease in the hospitalization rates that we care about. Um, initially, in the actual modeling we did with the um, random effects um, Poisson regression model for the IHGA data, we had, what did we have? We had a, a gamma 0 and a gamma 1. We had a, um, a sigma squared for the errors. So there were three parameters floating around, uh, and all three of them could be regarded as unknown to us. So that would be something like a theta vector where k was 3. Yes, please. Right. And that comes directly out of the problem context. Um, you're starting with a real world problem in science or engineering or technology or whatever it is. and um, you and the people you're working with identify a quantity of principal interest to you. And it could be multidimensional. It could be just a single number. It could be, but whatever it is, I'm going to call it theta. That's right, just to get to the theta. That's true. 
And in fact, you might discover partway through your study that you've been focusing on the wrong theta. Um, that's definitely correct. But if we hold theta in our minds, that's the thing we're wondering about and that we don't have complete information about. Now I make another axiom. This is item eight. There will typically be an information source that I'm going to think of as a data set, capital D, that you judge to be relevant to decreasing your uncertainty about theta. Now D, by definition, is always finite dimensional. You, you will never actually observe an infinite data set. And so D is actually always finite dimensional. It will sometimes look like a vector or a matrix or an array or even just a single number of real numbers. But in principle, it, could it also could be almost anything. Um, if someone took a video um, under conditions that made the video quite grainy of a scene that seemed to show part of a crime being committed, the data set could be that video because it has information about who the perpetrator of the crime was. And again, we could, if we wanted to, map that back to a vector, a finite vector. Uh, I'm going to think of capital D as a finite vector of length n, little n where n is an integer, a, a positive integer that's finite. Or in a famous example that I may have told you about before, um, there was uncertainty about um, who wrote um, some of the documents that were part of the founding politics of our country. There were these things called the Federalist Papers. I don't know whether you've ever studied this, this stuff. And um, they, were all, they were all published as anonymous pamphlets. And um, even today, there is still uncertainty amongst scholars of the history of politics in our country about who wrote the, the Federalist Papers. Um, and in particular, some of them are thought to have been written by Alexander Hamilton, others by James Madison, and there might be some third guy I'm forgetting. Um, so for that purpose, the data could consist of the words in a pamphlet, for example. And in fact, these guys, Mosteller and Wallace, back in the 1950s, did a wonderful study in which they um, used the words in the pamphlets and compared them with word patterns in known writings by Madison and Hamilton and so on and decided definitively who wrote those things. So the data set doesn't have to be numbers. It could actually be the words in a pamphlet or the words in a book. But again, whatever it is, it can, if we choose, be mapped onto a vector of real numbers of length, finite length n. And so I gave you those examples of script B already. Now it's an implication of these first eight things, in particular of the presence of, of the data set D, that right away, as soon as you talk about D, there is a dichotomy now on the information scale, namely your information about theta internal to D and your information about theta external to D. And that's a partition because the information either has to be in the internal part or the external part, and the internal plus the external parts add up to your total information about theta. Um, people, particularly Bayesians, often talk about a different dichotomy. They talk about your information about theta before the data set arrives, giving rise to that word prior from the Latin a priori that we saw earlier in the course. And also the other dichotomy is either the your information before or after the data set arrives and after mapping to the posterior distribution from uh, a posteriori for after. But actually, as I may have tried to argue previously, um, considerations of time with respect to when the data set arrives are are actually irrelevant. What matters is the information about theta that's internal to the data set you have and the information about it that's external to that data set. And now if I put the first nine items together, I can draw an implication. It now follows from those nine things, a, mixt a mixture of axioms and definitions and implications, that statistics concerns itself principally with five things. And I'm omitting description, I know for sure. Because it's non-probabilistic, I'm omitting data quality assurance and uh, probably some other stuff. But among the things I am including, um, uh, essentially it all boils down to five activities. First of all, step one, quantifying your information about theta internal to the data set. And all of that quantification will always be given the background information B. So quantifying that information and doing so well, and I have not yet defined the term well, but we want to do a, a good quantification of your information about theta internal to D, and I haven't said yet what good means. Two, the same thing except your information external to D. Three, once we have those two information sources, how to combine them, combining them and doing that combination well to create a summary of your total, uncertain, your total information that will summarize your current uncertainty 
and that includes all available information that you judge to be relevant. And step three is, uh, is the topic of statistical inference. And then, having used all this information, we can then go on to make predictions about future data values. So item four is the topic of prediction. And finally, we can also use all the information in step three to make, help people make decisions about how to act sensibly, even though we don't have as much information about data as we might like. And it's a basic foundational question in statistics. How should those five tasks be accomplished? That question, in turn, has two parts. It has a probability part and a statistics part. And I'm going to talk first about the probability foundations. Uh, and then I'll show you as we go along through this material that the statistics foundations, I think, still need some propping up, whereas the probability foundations seem to be pretty solid. Um, it's, it's, it's a thing that can be described with true-false propositions, and you don't know the truth of those true-false propositions. For example, in the IHG example, we don't know mu sub t because we didn't run the trial on everybody in Denmark, right? And we don't know mu sub c because we didn't run the trial on everybody in Denmark. So theta is um, the, the number we would get if we had been able to run it on everybody in Denmark, both with and without IHGA, and form that ratio mu t minus mu c over mu. So it's, it's actually a number here. And my uncertainty consists, I can summarize my uncertainty with a series of statements of the form true, false, theta is less than or equal to minus 0.05. True, false, theta is between minus 0.05 and 0, and so on. So I can, I can talk about my uncertainty about it through a series of true, false statements that talk about where it might live on the number line, for example. So let's look at the probability foundations first. So I'm on page 9 now. Um, I think I've told you a little bit about the history of probability right from the very beginning. Uh, the, t the two people who first started thinking about it carefully were Fermat and Pascal in that exchange of letters we talked about back in, in week one. They invented what's called the classical approach to probability. Then came the Bayesian story through Bayes and Laplace about 100 years later. And then during the period from about 1860 to 1930, um, there were three other guys who did um, uh, foundational work on the frequentist approach, namely John Venn and George Bull and Ricard von Mises. And all of these guys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all of these guys developed approaches for how to think about uncertainty quantification, but it was all done in an intuitive manner. No one ever tried to prove a theorem of the form, given particular premises, there's only one sensible way to quantify uncertainty. In other words, no one ever tried to put probability on a, a proper foundation as far as axioms were concerned until three people, and all of them did it um, in the 1930s and 40s. First was this guy Kolmogorov, then came De Finetti, and then came uh, the American physicist Richard Cox. Have I mentioned Richard Cox to you before today? A little bit in the first day, I think. I want to look at him a little more today. Um, so Kolmogorov did his work in the 30s, and he was trying to uh, clean up the intuitive stuff that Van and Bull and von Mises were, were putting out. Um, so he was trying to rigorize their story. But definitely he was a kind of follower of them, but a sort of mathematical follower of them. And for Kolmogorov, um, you have a sample space, capital omega, of uncertain possibilities. And probability is a function on some subsets of that sample space. And he makes the function, he constrains the function to obey some reasonable axioms. And he gets out a, a working definition of probability that has um, made Frequentis happy for decades and decades. Um, when capital omega is um, large, for example, when it's infinite, it turns out in his story, particularly when capital omega is something like the real line, so it's uncountably infinite, it turns out in Kolmogorov's story that he cannot meaningfully help you assign probabilities to all possible subsets of capital omega. Because if you've ever studied this stuff in set theory in any of your classes, the set of all subsets of the real numbers is an enormously large thing. The real numbers are themselves already uncountably infinite. And the set of all subsets of the real numbers is an order of infinity even higher than, than that. Um, there's all that stuff from that guy Cantor, right? That stuff about different orders of infinity. The, set of all subsets of a set is called the power set of that set. 
and two to the omega, where omega is the real number line, is so big, it's bigger than the mind of God, basically. It's, it's just, you can't even think about it. And so Kolmogorov found he was, it was not possible to assign meaningful probabilities to all of those subsets. So he had to invent a way to assign meaningful probabilities to some subset of, set of all subsets in a way that made that subset quite rich. And he invented that stuff um, that is very theoretical. I'm not going to go into it here. But that stuff involving measure theory with sigma fields and sigma algebras and all that stuff, he invented that stuff too, or he borrowed it from the measure theory guys as a way of rigorizing for Aquinas probability. However, many types of uncertainty cannot be fit into this framework. Um, what he was trying to, to make uh, precise was the, um, the intuitive notion that Mr. Venn had with his Venn diagrams of having capital Omega be a rectangle. And now I'm about to throw a dart at the rectangle. Maybe there's a blob in here called A. And I'm about to throw a dart at the, at the rectangle in such a way that the following two things are true. The dart has to land somewhere inside the rectangle, which is not true of me when I'm playing darts at the pub um, uh, with, res with, with respect to the dart board. I guess it, well, sometimes it hits the wall and falls down. Anyway, uh, But anyway, the dart has to land somewhere inside the rectangle. And also, every single place it could land is just as likely as every other place which rather does describe me when I'm playing darts. <laughs> uh, 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 and um, uh, so that means he had a relative frequency idea. He wondered how often the dart would fall inside a set like, like the blob A. And because the, the blob has to, I mean, the dart has to fall somewhere, um, the, if we normalize everything to pro probability adding up to 1, then the area of the rectangle can be taken to be 1. And the probability of A in, in um, Kolmogorov's world would then be the area of the blob for A divided by the area of the whole box, which is 1. And dividing by 1 just gives you back the thing in the numerator. So he tried to make that, that intuitive notion rigorous. And he succeeded in a certain way. Here's a quote from him. Have I shown you this quote before from Kolmogorov? I don't think so. The basis for the application of the results of the mathematical theory of probability to real, quote, random phenomena must depend on some form of the frequency concept of probability, the unavoidable nature of which has been established by his friend von Mises in a spirited manner. So according to Komogorov, there is no question. No one can, can doubt. It, uh, the only kind of probability has to be the frequency kind. And so this works really well for simple things. You're about, to, for, for instance, you're about to roll a pair of dice, and you regard this dice rolling as fair. Now, right away, that's a big judgment and assumption on your part, because there's nothing inherent in the dice that makes the dice rolling fair. I think we've talked about that before. With some practice, you can take a coin out of anybody's pocket in the room here and toss it for a while. People who are good at it anyway get the hang of it and toss it so that you can produce 10 heads in a row. Um, so there's nothing inherent in the coin that makes the coin fair with respect to tossing, and the same with the dice. So suppose you make the judgment that the dice rolling is fair, and what, all you mean by that is that in your judgment, all 36 elemental outcomes in, in capital omega, which is just 1, 1, dot, 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 up to 6, 6, all those 36 um, elemental outcomes are equally probable. Then, of course, Kolmogorov is able to tell you probabilities of any subset of those, um, of those guys. For instance, the Kolmogorov probability of snake eyes, which is a 1 on each die, that certainly that prob probability exists, and it's unique from your fairness judgment, namely one way it could happen out of 36 ways that the whole thing could happen, right? So... No problem there. That's, that's your Komogorov probability. Strictly speaking, he has to think about, um, actually, strictly speaking, if you ask him, what's the probability I'll get snake eyes the next time I roll the dice, he can't really tell you because it's a one-off. It's an event that, that it, first of all, it hasn't happened yet. And once it, hap once it has happened, it's a unique event of rolling the dice. All he can do is he can say, if you were to roll the dice a lot and keep track of the relative frequency with which you got snake eyes, it would be around 136. And the more you did it, the closer it would get to 136. That's his version of probability. However, what about this example? And again, help me if I've, if I've given you this example before. Uh, let's say you're a doctor, and a new patient comes into your office saying that he, let's say to have a pronoun for the patient, that he may be HIV positive. What's the Kolmogorov probability that he is? Well, right away, Komogorov is in trouble because he has to first identify his omega, his capital omega, his sample space. And it's not like rolling a pair of fair dice, is it? This patient is not the result of any uniquely specifiable, repeatable, random process like we would think about with dice rolling. Um, this guy is just a guy who walked into your office. You don't know anything about him. I mean, he's just a guy. And 
throw out any repetitions of whatever anybody's thinking about repeating, which is the whole story that Kolmogorov has to tell for the frequency business. Throughout that, all those repetitions, his HIV status is not fluctuating randomly. It's always fixed. He either is HIV positive or he's not. So the closest Kolmogorov can come is the following thing on the top of page 11. He can say, all right, I'm now going to imagine the set omega of all people who are similar to this patient in all relevant ways. And now we're going to start choosing people at random, one by one, at random, with replacement from that set. And we ask ourselves how often that you would get an HIV positive person if you repeatedly chose one person at random from that set. However, to make that operational, you have to specify what you mean by the phrase similar to in all relevant ways. And if I ask everybody in the room to write that down on separate papers in a secret ballot and pass it up to the front of the room, we would discover that there is no uniqueness to this. Different reasonable people would come up with different ways to specify the omega here according to their definitions of what is meant by similar to in all relevant ways. And so there goes Kolmogorov's so-called objectivity because he can't even come up with a unique omega in a problem as simple and yet as important as this one. Somebody walks into your office, is the guy HIV positive or not? You can't do Kolmogorov probability with that. In fact, any process that involves purely observational data gathering in which you just see what the world gives you rather than having intervened to create some random sample or something like that, any process like that, Kolmogorov is strictly speaking in a lot of trouble because it's not clear what his omega is. And even if you can come up with one of uh, an omega for him, your friend sitting next to you might well come up with a different omega. And that means that the two of you could end up with different probabilities for the same thing. And according to, particularly according to John Venn, that was supposed to never happen. That was his whole idea about objectivity. Remember in the, in the very first, first week of the class. So there's Kolmogorov. Uh, if I asked him that problem, if, if he were still alive, um, and I asked him this problem, he would say, um, I agree with you that, I, that we're uncertain about whether this guy is HIV positive or not, but you cannot use my kind of probability to quantify that uncertainty. The Kolmogorov probability that that guy is HIV positive is undefined. He would basically just say, I'm sorry, I've, I've created a theory that works in some problems and it doesn't work in others, and this is you just identified one where my theory doesn't work, so okay, go find another theory. That would be Kolmogorov's answer. Now, De Finetti tried to do better. Um, he was trying to follow behind Mr. Bayes and make uh, Mr. Bayes' ideas rigorous. For De Finetti, as I showed you in the first week, probability is a quantification of betting odds about the truth of a true-false proposition. And those betting odds, again, are constrained to obey axioms that guarantee logical internal consistency, a kind of absence of internal contradictions. And I think we looked at them in the first week. Those, they're called the coherence axioms. This is more general than Kolmogorov. In fact, it's as general as you can get because any statement about sets can be translated into a statement about propositions. And so this is as general as you can get. But the reason I don't like to base my way of thinking about probability on De Finetti is that I don't think that betting odds are fundamental to science. And really, that's his notion of probability is based completely on betting odds. You have to imagine betting with someone about the truth of a true-false proposition and ask yourself what odds you would need to give or receive in order that you judge the bet to be fair. And that translates directly back from odds to probabilities in the usual way. Now, he made a lot of important contributions. He talked about exchangeability. He's the one who invented it. We talked about that um, uh, in week one or two. Uh, and he did wonderful things. But for me, science is about information, not betting. And so I'm drawn myself to this guy, Richard Cox, and especially to this guy, Ed Jaynes, um, who followed on from Richard Cox, and um, about whose book I've already told you. So Richard Cox, not to be confused with a famous statistician named David Cox, who did work, important work on survival analysis, Richard Cox is a physicist. And he was thinking about probability and uncertainty from first principles. And he came up with a completely different way to think about it. He, it turns out, was essentially following and trying to rigorize Laplace. And so for Richard Cox, probability is a quantification of information about the truth of one or more propositions. And you make the, you have to constrain that information in such a way that it obeys axioms that guarantee internal logical consistency. I like this the best because it's both fundamental to science, because science is all about information, and it's as general as you can get because it's, it's based on probabilities operating on propositions. So he tried to create a primitive thing called PL, 
open parenthesis, capital A, vertical bar, capital B, close parenthesis, which stood for the plausibility of the true-false proposition A, given that it, according to your information base, the true-false proposition B is true. That's what that means, the plausibility of A given B. And think of it as a measure of numerical weight of evidence in favor of the truth of A, given that you regard the, the true-false statement B as true. So he tried to identify what basic rules that plausibility operator should follow so that it behaves sensibly. And unlike Kolmogorov, whose axioms seem quite arbitrary, um, Mr. Cox's axioms come directly out of the science of the world, trying to understand the world. And yet he ends up with a, with a system of probability that, that obeys exactly the same rules that Kolmogorov does, but, but in a world in which he's thinking about propositions rather than sets. So here are Mr. Cox's principles to try to make operational the word sensible. He supposes, first of all, that you're willing to represent degrees of plausibility by real numbers. In other words, when PL is like a machine, you feed in the A, capital A, and the capital B, and it gives you back out a number on the number line. Secondly, we all insist that our reasoning be logically consistent. And here's what he means by that. There's actually two parts to, three parts to his logical consistency. Firstly, if a plausibility assessment can be arrived at in more than one way, then every possible way must lead to the same value. I think you'd agree with me that is something that has to be true. Secondly, um, we always take into account all of the evidence we judge to be relevant to that plausibility assessment. And this is a kind of Bayesian version of objectivity. Um, people who are trying to win an argument with each other do not always conform to this principle. Um, people trying to win an argument often focus on the facts that they regard as strongest in support of their argument and neglect to mention those facts that are not in support of their argument. And I'm thinking in particular of various politicians that we all are, are, are accustomed to over the last 20 years, let's say. But you're not allowed to do that in Cox's world. Um, that's not good science. You have to take into account all of the evidence that's relevant. And thirdly, equivalent states of information always have to be represented by equivalent plausibility assignments. So those are his basic principles. They come, as I said, right out of the science of trying to live with uncertainty. They don't come out of arbitrary mathematical, just things that Kolmogorov plucked out of the air. And now he gets a set of axioms from those principles. And here they come. The plausibility of a proposition determines the plausibility of its negation. And each of those things decreases as the other one increases. I think you'd agree that was pretty sensible as well to assume as an axiom. Then he has to assume the following thing, which again should make pretty good sense to you. The plausibility of the true-false proposition that you get by taking the proposition A proposition B and linking them together with an and so that the result is only true if both A and B are true, which I'm going to write, it's called a conjunction in logic, and I'm going to write it as a product, AB, um, uh, in the same way that Cox and, and Jaynes do. The plausibility of the conjunction of two propositions A and B depends only on the following things, the plausibility of B and then the plausibility of A given that B is true, or the other way around. And essentially, that reminds us of the way we would think about something like this. What's the probability that it will rain tomorrow on the rain gauge on top of this building, let's say there was one, to an accumulation of at least one millimeter of rain? We'll make that quite hard and fast. Tomorrow, between midnight tonight and midnight the next night, and also rain a week from tomorrow. Well, to figure out that the probability of that happening, first you work out the probability of it raining tomorrow. And then you work out the probability of it raining a week from now, given that it rained tomorrow. You always have to chain along. You have to keep, you have to bring with you what you started with. So it, it goes like B followed by A given B, or it could do, you could do it any other way around. You could go A followed by B given A. But that's how plausibility of conjunctions work. And there is no other way. And then thirdly, he says, suppose A and B is equivalent in information content to C and D. Then if you acquire A and then get information B, and you update all your plausibilities each time, and I instead acquire C and then later get D, then we have to end up in the same place. Because after all, A and B is supposed to be equivalent to C and D. These all, I hope you'd agree with me, seem quite sensible 
to choose his axioms, and amazingly, on the basis only of those axioms, he's able to prove a theorem. Uncertainty quantification about propositions has to behave in one and only one way. I'm on the top of page 14 now. And his theorem says, if you accept his axioms, then to be logically consistent, you have to quantify uncertainty as follows. Now we can start calling your plausibility operator your probability, capital P of A is being true given that B is true. And those probabilities have to be between 0 and 1, with certain truth given of A given B represented by 1 and certain falsehood by 0. Secondly, the chance of A plus the chance of not A has to add up to 1. And thirdly, you get the product rule, which we've already seen. You want to know what's the chance of A and B both being true given C? You multiply A given C times B given A and C, or the other way around. And he arrives at these rules by the most amazing logic. Um, he uses functional analysis. He takes the, the um, axioms, and they in turn lead to two functional equations, both of which are quite famous in the history of that part of mathematics that the plausibility operation has to satisfy, and then he solves those equations, and out come the rules of probability. It's really quite wonderful. And I think I have posted on the web page for the course um, one of the papers that he used to write about this, and you can read more about it there if you like. Now, there's a whole bunch of important corollaries. We're mostly interested in the corollaries, not in the theorem. Uh, first of all, the sum rule that we're used to about how OR works, um, uh, I'll show you there at the top of page 15, that comes out as a cor an immediate corollary. Also, you can extend the product and sum rules to an arbitrary finite number of propositions, and that all proceeds quite easily. Although, as you'll see in the middle of page 15, uh, when you start putting a whole bunch of things together connected with ORs, um, uh, like plus signs, then it starts getting very complicated, but you can do it. Do as many as many of these things as you want, uh, as long as they're finite. Next, here's an interesting thing. This framework obviously cover, covers optimal reasoning about uncertain quantities that take on a finite number of values. But it turns out it handles with equal ease situations in which the set, let's call it capital theta, of possible values of lowercase theta has infinitely many elements. And so here's an example from my work at Kaiser. I'm studying quality of care at the 17 Kaiser Permanente Northern California hospitals in the time window from the beginning of 2003 to the end of 2007. And that was before the era of electronic medical records. Um, I don't know whether any of you belong to Kaiser or not. Uh, if you do, um, you will now be in a system where every single thing you do from cradle to grave in the Kaiser um, Permanente system um, is recorded as fast as possible in an electronic medical record. Instead of writing stuff down on pieces of paper, which I think you'll agree is a kind of barbaric thing for us to be doing in a year like 2013, um, everything is now electronic in the entire Kaiser system. And that permits people like me to, to really do wonderful things, in principle anyway, because we now have a complete electronic longitudinal record of, of people from cradle to grave. And so the richness of that data set is unbelievable. Um, this stuff has all been sitting around. It's just been sitting around in folders in the basement of hospitals where, where the numbers were written down on a piece of paper, a series of pieces of paper. The last time you went to the hospital, you got hospitalized, and I hope it doesn't happen to you very often, but the last time you got hospitalized, when they came in to take your vital signs, how did they process that information? They wrote it down on a piece of paper, and they put it in a folder and put the folder on the door of your room. And then two hours later, when someone came to take your vital signs again, they wrote it down on another piece of paper and put that piece of paper in the folder. And if you were a doctor and you tried to spread all the pieces of paper out on the table and visualize the time series, which you would need to have as a doctor to see whether, whether vital signs are trending bad, uh, up or down, for example, it was damn hard to do. Um, and so, and this, was still, this is still true in many hospitals around the world, right here in America, for instance, and all over Europe. Um, uh, and we're supposed to be the ones with really good medical systems, and yet the, the medical informatics of gathering data in, in the hospital uh, in a real-time fashion is abysmal. Um, Mr. Obama, when he was first elected, wanted to um, incentivize this whole process of, of everything becoming electronic in the medical world as fast as possible by giving a lot of money to facilities to do this, but then that money all got, it all just got grabbed up in that big uh, financial crisis back in 2008. So. Um, the process of going fully electronic in real time with the medical records is something that's quite slow. At the moment, Kaiser and the VA, the Veterans Administration, are the only two major institutions in the whole world that, that have gone fully electronic. Uh, 
and uh, there are others in Boston and other places where medicine is quite strong that are moving toward it as quickly as they as they can. But to, the reason I bring it up is that back in 2003 through seven, we didn't have electronic medical records, so we actually had to learn information about quality of care by taking random samples of patient folders that were in the basement of hospitals and and pulling the folders out and 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 uh, transcribing the data from those folders into, into proper data sets. So we had a population script P of 8,561 patients at these facilities with a primary admission diagnosis of heart attack. I'll call that, that um, population size capital N. Now we took a simple random sample of little n equals 112 of these admissions. That means um, uh, at random without replacement. And we recorded um, a number of things. And one of them was whether or not each patient had something bad happen, uh, which was called an unplanned transfer to the intensive care unit, or ICU for short. When you're in a general medical ward, you do not want to deteriorate so quickly that they have to rush you to the ICU. That's a bad sign for you. Um, and so unplanned transfer to the ICU is a bad outcome. Um, let's find out how often it happens and try to change our behavior so it doesn't happen very often. Well, fortunately, for these uh, sampled patients, it didn't happen very often. Only four patients out of the 112 had this, this bad thing happen to them. I'm going to define theta, the unknown thing of interest to me here, to be the proportion of such unplanned transfers in the whole population, which we couldn't get at because we didn't have enough money to, to uh, sample all 8,561 of these records. We only had enough money to sample 112 of them. So S divided by little s divided by little n is a good guess for theta, right? Four out of 112, but it's not theta. It's just a good guess for it. Now, the set of possible values for theta, capital theta here, starts at zero and goes up to one in increments of one over capital N. Because theta represents the proportion of these bad things in all of the population. So back in the 8,561 people, there could be none of them at all, or one, or two, or three, or four, or dot, 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 all the way up to 8,561. And I guess, actually, after we've seen that there's four of them in the sample, um, zero over capital N is no longer possible in the population. But uh, uh, my point is that capital N is really big. And so that set, capital omega, has 8,562 values in it that are each separated by a distance of only 1 over 8,561. And that's quite a small number. So what if we just approximate that discrete story by the, by the uh, unit interval from 0 to 1? Why not? So now the theta prime that we're working with is uncountably infinite in terms of how many elements there are in it. Can we still do Mr. Cox's version of probability? Answer, yes. Prior to 2003, the proportion of such unplanned transfers for heart attack patients at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California was about 7%. I'm going to call that number Q. And so interest focuses on the following thing. The probability that some proposition A is true, given the data set D and the background information script B, and A is the proposition that theta is less than or equal to Q. In other words, in the truth, in the period from 2003 to 2007, is it still um, less than or equal to 7%, or is it, um, is it um, uh, bigger than that? And capital D is the proposition that we got S equals 4. We got four people with this bad thing happening. And script B includes various propositions, including things like um, the sample size is 112, and the, the, um, the elements in the sample were chosen at random without replacement. People usually call theta in this setup a population parameter. And clearly, it's not itself the result of any sampling experiment. It's just a number that we don't happen to know. And for this reason, it's not possible to directly quantify uncertainty about theta from the Kolmogorov point of view. Again, Kolmogorov would say, I can tell you by having studied what statisticians did with my probability system, I can tell you a kind of indirect way to make probability statements that look sort of like probability statements about theta using that confidence trick that I showed you for Mr. Naiman back in week one or two. But uh, Kolmogorov cannot give you a way to, to directly quantify uncertainty about theta from his point of view. But of course, it makes perfect sense to do so from this propositional point of view. So now that we've thought about the probability that theta is less than or equal to Q, given the data and script B, we can now regard that as a function of Q. Nothing prevent us from doing that. So top of page 17, I'm going to define a function f of q, which is the probability that the proposition theta less than or equal to q is true, given the data in the background. And strictly speaking, I would have to call it f subscript theta given the data and the background information. But it's a function of q, 
and we could call it the cumulative distribution function, or CDF, for your uncertainty about theta given B and B. And um, Mr. Jaynes is careful to point out that it's not the cumulative distribution function of theta, because theta is just a number we don't know. It's the cumulative distribution function for your uncertainty about theta. And that's an important distinction, because um, we if we confuse those two things, namely theta on the one hand and our uncertainty about theta on the other hand, then we can fall into some pretty nasty, um, bad um, habits of thought. Um, theta is something in the world. My uncertainty about theta is not of the world. It's an expression of what I know about the world. And those are two different things. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, as a mathematical question, if that function of Q turns out to be continuous in Q and differentiable in Q, then if you wanted to work out F evaluated at B minus F of A, which would be the probability that the proposition that theta is between A and B, the chance that that proposition is true, you could find um, the partial, you could find, work out the partial derivative of, of capital F with respect to Q and call it lowercase p. And that would be the thing that we usually refer to as the density function for your uncertainty about theta given b and b. And the way you would work out um, the probability in, in equation one is you'd integrate that little density function from a to b. This is the usual thing we do with continuous uncertainty, right? Now, um, p subscript theta given d and b of q and capital F subscript theta given d and b given q, that's very cumbersome to, to write down. So in a, a small abusive notation, People instead write capital F of theta given D and B and lowercase p of theta given D and B instead of those more complicated things. And the, what, the idea is that we're going to let the argument theta of those two functions serve as a reminder of the quantity that's uncertain. That will generally not create any confusions. This is quite different from Mr. Kolmogorov's world. In his world, a random variable capital X turns out to be a function that starts in omega and ends up in some outcome space, capital O, which is often the real number line. And then you'll often find it useful to summarize the behavior of X through the CDF. And now it would be what you could call, using Kolmogorov's world, the CDF of the random variable X. In other words, capital F sub capital X of little x is the CDF for capital X evaluated at the point little x. Strictly speaking, in the Kolmogorov world, it's the probability that the set of, of little omega points inside the sample space big omega, such that capital X of little omega is less than or equal to X, that, that corresponds to that probability. And no one likes to write that down. It's too complicated looking. So everybody uh, in the, the uh, Kolmogorov world um, cheats. Um, and they use the incorrect shorthand, which is actually the one that Mr. Cox invented. It's, it's a propositional shorthand. They write down that the CDF evaluated little x is the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to x. That's actually a propositional statement. It's not a, a set statement. But uh, everybody in that world does it because the set statement is so cumbersome. And interestingly, in the Richard Cox approach, there aren't any random variables. So in the Kolmogorov approach, you have random variables everywhere. But in the Richard Cox approach, there aren't any random variables. They're just things that you're uncertain about. Call them theta, whose uncertainty can often be summarized with CDFs and densities. So theta is not really a random variable in the Bayesian approach. Theta is a number you just don't happen to know. And you find yourself using the machinery of random variables through CDFs and densities to help quantify your uncertainty about it. So theta is not really a random variable. Um, the only random variable story anybody's created involves thinking about sets. And, and uh, in Cox's world, the thing we're uncertain about, the probability operator, p of a given b, the thing that goes in there are true-false propositions, not sets. Now, a minute ago, I drew a distinction between um, the CDF for theta versus the CDF of theta. And Ed Jaynes has a wonderful uh, little uh, page or two in which he tries to make this clear. Look at these two statements on page 18. The first statement says, there is noise in this room. And the second statement says, this room is noisy. Um, those statements sound nearly identical to each other, nearly equivalent in content in the English language. But they're not. Because actually, the first statement, there is noise in this room, is what the philosophers call ontology. It's ontological. It asserts the physical existence of something. It's a, it's a description of the world 
whereas the statement, the room is noisy, uh, is something that you're saying from your point of view. If you don't have any of those mufflers on your, like, what's that company, Bose, that makes those things that, that deaden all the noise around you? If you don't have those things on, the room is noisy to you. But if you have them on, the room is not noisy to you. So the room is noisy is actually quite different from saying there's noise in the room. It's, it's what the philosophers call epistemological. It expresses the personal perception of the individual making the statement. Rather than trying to say something about the world, you're describing your own perception of that thing. And so the way that plays out in, in um, probability is that we all have to be very careful not to confuse theta on the one hand with your uncertainty about theta on the other hand. Theta is ontological. Your uncertainty about theta is epistemological. It changes with your information. It's not, in other words, your information about the world is not the same as the world itself. And people writing in probability, according to Mr. Jaynes, and ever since I read his book, I'm starting to see he's right, very often confuse the two. And he has a name for it. Um, he calls it the mind projection fallacy. It's as though you're pretending that the world is the same as what's going on inside your head. And if you make that pretend too often, you can end up saying some pretty silly things probabilistically. So, um, so this is the basic confusion between the world on the one hand, which is ontology, with your uncertainty about the world. That's epistemology. And those things are very different from each other. For instance, um, what's your current probability that the 100th digit after the decimal point in the decimal expansion of pi is 3? Probably most of us would have 10%, right? Um, and yet, I could fire up the Maple program and ask it to print out the first 100-some digits of pi, and we could look and see whether it was 3 or not. When we're done, pi has not changed. That digit has not changed. But our information about that digit has changed. So it's crucial to make a distinction between the world on the one hand and your information about the world on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Given B. Mm -hmm. Dave, Dave Finetti creates a primitive operator called um, your betting odds in favor of the proposition that, in favor of the truth of, of proposition A, given that you are prepared to regard the proposition B as true. So for him, the primitive is, is betting odds which he then converts to probabilities in the usual way we go from odds to probabilities, whereas the primitive for, for Richard Cox was this plausibility operator. Um, yes, uh, and the only reason that I don't like it, and by the way, if you like Definetti's way of doing things, th there will be no change between the stuff I'm showing you in this class and the Definetti way in terms of operational making things operational. But I find it more natural to help myself and others think scientifically to think about information rather than betting. I just don't find betting to be central to the process of, of learning about the world. Um, and if you're, per, if you're someone who does, then um, I'm very happy for you to replace everything I say. Every time I write down the word Cox in, in a phrase like Cox's theorem, you could put De Finetti. In, in his place, and you'll get all the same results. It's just that Cox thinks about these things in terms of information, whereas De Finetti thinks about them in terms of betting. Yes, please. Um, boy, that's a good question. Um, there are people who study quantum mechanics today who believe that they're is a true core of unknowability about aspects of the universe. Um, and for them, they might be prepared to say that down at the quantum level, there are things that occur that can only be described by us in trying to understand the world using words like random. But in fact, when you read Mr. James's book, um, he believes that the only reason quantum mechanics people take that view today is that we have not yet peeled down another layer of understanding to the point where we don't have to pretend that way. So for if, if, 
I myself don't know the answer to your question. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, I can share with you um, Ed Jaynes's answer, which is um, it's all uncertainty. It's all information. And um, uh, the, when something looks random to you, that's just a way of saying that your information is not sufficient to be able to predict it accurately. That would be a way to talk about it. Um, we can create things inside computers called pseudo-random number generators, but they're not really random, right? They're just pseudo-random. Um, so I don't know if I've helped to touch on at least something like an answer to your question, but, but that, those are some thoughts that occurred to me. Um, that, you, your question is almost philosophical, Ra rather, rather, than a, rather than something that we have to decide in order to know how to behave to quantify probabilities, for example. Um, yes, it may be a distinction without a difference operationally on the th problems we're trying to solve right now, but you're right. Um, you remember um, another thing that Laplace did uh, as a scientist, as a physicist, was he claimed, uh, he, he bought into um, uh, Newton so strongly that he claimed that uh, um, if you could know the um, position and velocity of every particle in the universe at one single moment, then you could predict the future course of the universe with perfect accuracy. He, he, he believed something like that, an incredibly uh, Newton to the 10th power sort of way of looking at things. Um, and uh, I guess what you're saying, it's interesting, is that the, the Cox and Ed Jaynes approach to the world is sort of like that, isn't it? That, that, that at some level of deep understanding, everything becomes clear, <laughs> and we don't have any uncertainty anymore. But until we've reached that level of, of, of knowledge, we use the machinery and language of, of, of probability and, and apparent randomness to describe our, our information state. I guess that's a good way to think about it. Now, I'm returning now to uh, page 19. Um, there are, we want next to look at the corollaries of Cox's theorem um, and see what they imply for how we should go about quantifying our uncertainty. And so, um, Given the set script B of propositions summarizing your background assumptions and judgments about how the world works as far as theta is concerned and the data and the future data, then it turns out to be natural and in fact you must be prepared in this approach to specify two conditional probability distributions. The first one, P of theta given B, we recognize as what we previously called the prior distribution, your prior distribution, and it's intended to quantify all information about theta external to the data set that you possess and judge relevant. And then the second one, P of D given theta and B, we recognize that as what we usually call the sampling distribution. And we then convert that into the likelihood function by thinking of it as a function of theta for fixed D. And that quantifies your predictive uncertainty given theta about the data set D before it's arrived. But you can also regard it as, the frequentists think of it as a sampling distribution. They say, if you knew what theta was, I can now use that function P of D given theta and B to tell you about all different kinds of data sets you might get if you were to get lots of data sets how they might differ from each other. And then um, we get finally to Bayes' theorem. Given those distributions, those two distributions in A, it turns out that the, one of the corollaries of Cox's theorem is that there's one and only one way that you can combine those two things together to get a logically internally consistent summary of everything you know. And it has to be Bayes' theorem, which is equation two on the top of page 20. You multiply those two distributions, thought of as functions of theta for fixed data, and renormalize. And the result on the left, P of theta given B and B, as we know, is we usually call that your posterior distribution. And it, it completely solves the inference problem. And I see that we've come to our next break. So I'll stop now and start again at 11.30. BC Ops people, we can turn off now and start again at 11.30.